I'm a person that looks forward more than looks back. When I started 50 years ago as an entrepreneur, the word entrepreneur I don't think existed. The airline's the brainchild of Richard Branson, the 34 year old billionaire head of the Virgin Records empire. I think an entrepreneur is somebody that creates something that makes a positive difference to other people's lives. I'm a born optimist, you know, very positive person. Both my children have inherited that from me. And I was very lucky, I had a very happy childhood. One of the things I enjoy the most is teaching people to swim. Now, you shouldn't sink, Archbishop. You just go. I find it quite an easy thing to do, and it's wonderfully satisfying to help them stand on their own two feet. Yay! That was brilliant. Why do you have so much money? <laughs> the exciting thing about learning to be an entrepreneur is then later on in life, you can be creating not-for-profit businesses, not-for-profit things to try to deal with the problems of the world. I've been lucky enough to you know, help create the Elders, which is a wonderful group of people that are trying to tackle conflict resolution issues in the world. The Elders can become a fiercely independent and robust force for good. The Oceanic Elders to try to tackle the problems of the oceans. The Carbon Warum to try to tackle climate change. My attitude in life is to give everything I can to solve the problem. You know, trying to go to space has been tough, very tough. You know, the old saying, it's not rocket science. Well, obviously, if you're trying to go to space, it is rocket science. I get enormous satisfaction trying to achieve something that has never been achieved before. favorite phrase to all the, all the people around me is screw it just get on and do it Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, is anything wrong with this man? <laughs> what? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> We're not going to allow that to happen. <laughs> So, Richard, you've only been here for three minutes, and you're already defacing pen property. <laughs> that was a pen tie. Thank you for that. Well, <laughs> uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, Sir Richard Branson. Thank you. I mean, I've had 50 years trying to stop people wearing ties. I've failed. I've, I've absolutely failed, but we'll keep trying. <laughs> anyway. So, I have to say, this is, this is a bittersweet moment for me because I just feel like life is more fun when you're in it. And we don't get you on campus very often. So can you walk us through a little bit how to have more fun in life while still, I don't know, earning a billion dollars? <laughs> um, well, I do think, I do think, uh, I'm obviously set up a lot of businesses. And I do think a lot of uh, businesses take themselves far too seriously. I think, um, you know, how you, how you spend your time at home should be, to a very large extent, how you spend your time at work. Um, and I think it's up to the person who's running, the, running a company uh, to you know, be willing to let their hair down, to be willing to be 
the first to dance on the table in a party, uh, to be will willing to be the first in the swimming pool fully clothed, uh, to get the parties going, to make sure everybody has a good time. And, um, and it's more fun for, for you. I mean, if, as long as you can change your clothes, it's not too co you're not too wet all the time. But uh, it's more fun for you as well. So, um, so uh, you know, so we, 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 like, we like to run a company where, or run, run companies where everybody is, is looking forward to coming into work and they don't think, ouch, it's Monday morning, I've got, I've got to go to work. Um, and we, we go all out of our way to try to make sure that's the case. So how do you do that? Like, if I, if I work at Virgin, what does that mean in my everyday life? Well, um, we, different companies experiment with different approaches. I mean, the, the Virgin group, um, I mean, obviously, you can come as you dress, as you wish to dress. If you want to wear a tie, you can wear a tie. Uh, surpri unsurprisingly, not many people do wear ties. Um, and they, uh, so, yeah, so first of all, you, 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 you know, you just, you just dress comfortably, whatever, whatever you feel. Um, uh, if you, uh, um, if you want to work from home, you, you can work from home. Um, if you want to work from home on Fridays and Mondays, you can work from home on Fridays and Mondays. If you want to take two months off and travel the world fully paid, uh, you can do that. Um, uh, you know, we try to have, you know, if you want a job share, you can job share. Um, as much flexibility as possible. Um, and we find that people don't abuse it. Um, in fact, if anything, we have to be careful that they don't go too far the other way. Um, because if you give them a lot of trust, they're, they're, they're really careful not to, not to abuse it. And, um, uh, and you're just treating, you're treating, you know, treating people as adults. Um, now, if you run an airline, it's slightly more difficult. Um, don't think I'm going to turn up for two months <laughs> to fly the planes. Um, so obviously, we, we have to have slightly different, you know, uh, we have to have slightly different rules for, say, pilots or cabin crew. But um, but with, with 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 you know people working for things like offices, there's no reason at all why you can't run a company like that. And we've been doing it now for a while, and it works. So let, let's talk about airlines a little bit. One of my all-time favorite quote, quotes was when you said, if you want to be a millionaire, it's really simple. First be a billionaire and then start an airline. <laughs> what, why is this industry so hard and so broken? Well, when we started in this industry, um, uh, there, was, um, there was Pan Am. Uh, there was with 300 planes. There was TWA with 300 planes. There was Air Florida with 300 planes. There was People Express with a couple of hundred planes. Uh, there was British Caledonian. Anyway, and, and so it goes on. And not one of those names exists today. Um, and we actually had w one plane <laughs> against against all these. Um, so, you know, on on paper, people thought we'd have no chance at all of surviving. Um, I remember Lord King, who ran British Airways, said, um, uh, too old to rock and roll, because I've been in the record business, too young to fly. Um, he won't last a year. Um, anyway, that was 35 years ago. Um, and, um, and I think um, the, what, the reason that Virgin Atlantic survived and, and all these others disappeared was um, because we were different. I mean, we, you know, people, he, you know he, well, another quote he said was, how on earth can somebody from the entertainment business uh, entertain going into the airline business? And of course, you know, in those days, um, airlines didn't entertain you. I mean, you, you, you got a, a lump of chicken dumped in your lap. Uh, you, if you were lucky, they might, have, they might have shown one sort of grainy, grainy film on a big screen. Um, uh, the cabin crew hated their jobs. They, you know, they hated the fact that people were complaining all the time because you know, there were no vegetarian meals or macrobiotic meals, all the things that, they, that people had promised that they would have. Um, and they got grumpy. Um, and so, you know, when we threw in, into that mix, mix uh, a 747 with stand-up bars and fun staff and, and, you know, and all, you know, we, start, we, we were six years ahead of, ahead of anybody else putting seatback videos and, um, and uh, and made sure that our staff had all the tools to do a great job. Um, then, um, then when you know British Airways launched that, you know, and most of these people are too young to know this, but they they launched a 
the infamous Dirty Tricks campaign to drive us out of business. But, but we only had four planes at the time. And they went to extraordinary lengths to get rid of us. Um, you know, they had um, teams of people uh, you know, sneaking out early in the morning and going through my rubbish bins in my home. And they got caught, caught doing that one day, um, trying to see, find anything incriminating. We had a, a gay nightclub. They would go through the bins at the gay nightclub looking for needles so they could then sell the story to the news of the world, which was uh, one of Murdoch's rags. And, um, and, 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 and they did find a needle, and they did sell the story to the news of the world. Um, but uh, we, we survived that one. Um, and, um, and then they would you know, try to spread stories in the press about our finances. I suspect they were true, because it's, it's tough running an airline, but they, anyway, they were trying to <laughs> spread them. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and then they set up, you know, then this was, this, yeah, this was really bad. They set up a, um, a uh, department behind locked doors with a team of people that illegally access, was illegally accessing our computer information. And they were, they were ringing, they, they were illegally accessing computer information, finding out the, um, uh, the names of our passengers, ringing them up, pretending to be from Virgin and telling them that, you know, I'm so sorry, but um, the flight's been cancelled today and then switching them to BA. And um, unfortunately, one of the people in that computer organization felt so badly about what he was doing uh, that he came and saw us about it. Um, anyway, we took them to court. We won the biggest libel damages in history. Um, it was uh, Christmas time. Um, and um, so we <laughs> handed them out to all our staff equally. It was, it was known as the BA, British Airways Christmas bonus. Um, <laughs> and um, I must admit, when I came out of the court, I was, wow. <laughs> we, we felt so good. Um, and, um, uh, and then we thought, you know, we, had, we, had, we, we, we just took the, took the mickey. And I don't know if you have that phrase in America. Anyway, we pulled their tail quite a bit. Um, there, were, there was one occasion where um, they decided to sponsor the London Wheel, which is the massive wheel just op opposite the House of Commons. And um, I got a call at six in the morning, and, um, and I was told they'd had technical problems, and, but they had, they'd flown in all the world's press from everywhere to, wa to watch this wheel go up. And um, so uh, we happened to have an airship company, and we scrambled this airship, and. Uh, it flew over the wheel at about nine o'clock that morning, um, and I don't know whether we've got the picture, but um, uh, they. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, so they we were so we basically having won the court case. We had a lot of fun. Um, you know, we, we dressed up as pirates and we took over their Concord. And anyway, we, we, we just went, we, 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 we were a real pain in the ass for a while. <laughs> we had, we had a, and, um, and I think, again, um, if you can do, if, you, if, you're, if you've got a company you believe in and you can do things and make people smile, make people laugh, um, get, get on the front pages of the paper rather than the back pages. It, you know, that, whatever it was, that was a lot cheaper than, um, you know, taking a whole lot of full-page adverts and saying how wonderful we were. Um, and, uh, and I think it, it built Virgin up into um, a, fun, a fun brand, which you know, meant that we could sort of stretch it into uh, yeah, a lot of different areas over the years. That's one of many examples of you just hating monopolies and bureaucracies. Um, did this, is this something you remember as a child? Just this deep distaste for giant companies and a desire to, to poke at them a little bit? Or, or how did you develop that passion? Um, as a child, um, business in Britain was run by, um, I mean, it was almost like Soviet, uh, Soviet Russia. It was um, dominated by companies that were run by governments. So British Gas, British Coal, British Steel, British Airways. British Rail, etc., and you know, go go governments, you know, they not only don't know how to run countries, but they don't know how to run companies either, um, <laughs> and um, uh, and they and they and they they definitely don't know how to run co companies, and um, so uh, so 
Yeah, so for instance, with British Rail, um, you know, we, I went along to, um, uh, well, I got the head of British Rail to come and, uh, come and see me, first of all, and, and said, said to him, you know, wouldn't it be more exciting if British Rail was broken up into smaller units and people like myself and others could run chunks of it? And, um, and we had a very amiable conversation. Uh, he, uh, I, I'll tell this story in my book. Um, he then left the room and, uh, and he was, as he was leaving, leaving the front door, um, the intercom had got stuck on and, and, and booming all over the house was, I'm not gonna let that fucker Branson get his hands on our rail, our rail, our rail network. <laughs> so I think we, we got the message that he didn't, um, uh, he didn't actually want us to take over <laughs> the rail. Anyway, turn the clock forward a couple of years. Um, he, um, uh, um, uh, we, we, we did end up taking over the biggest chunk of Britain's rail network. And, um, and I think, you know, we did what we, we did to rail, what we did to the airline business. We made it fun. We brought in brand new, you know, high speed Pendolino trains. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in order to, you know, get the, the staff who'd worked for the government for years, you know, to kickstart them into the Virgin philosophy, um, I invited all 20,000 of them into, out to a massive party in the countryside. Um, we made it a you know, four-day weekend party. They brought their children. Um, yeah, they brought their tents, or we, we arranged tents. We had uh, bands playing. We had log fires at nighttime, people, you know, people playing guitars. Uh, and you know, by the end of the weekend, they, they'd had a blast. They went back. They'd become virgin people. Um, and, I mean, and... Uh, and you know they've been loyal ever since. And and on the West Coast Main Line in Britain, we've managed to increase the numbers from eight million to forty million people using using that track. Um, and um, and it's so busy that we thought the other day maybe we should um, we needed quicker trains. <laughs> and um, you know hence um, Virgin Hyperloop and, and uh, a new a new a new announcement that we just made last week. So you do have this new book out, uh, two decades after the, the previous autobiography. Sorry if I offended anybody with that word. I was just suddenly thinking, I went after it come out of the mouth, I thought, oops. Anyway. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a phrase that you're fond of. I think it's, screw it, let's do it. So uh, we'll go with it. But I'm curious, uh, I, I, was, I was puzzled when I read the title because my, my understanding was that when you lose your virginity, you can't find it again, right? It's, it's, it's gone. So what, what, what is this about? Why did you write this book? <laughs> well, I, 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 we're, we're still looking. For, <laughs> we're still looking. <laughs> there. Um, no, I think. Look, I loved. I loved trying things for the first time, and um, and <laughs> even <laughs> even if I'm sort of groping my way to try to learn about things, I, 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 I like. I don't know. I don't know. Do you, should, I mean, my, the very first time, for those people who didn't read my first book, um, uh, it was, you know, Losing My Virginity was obviously a pun on the company, but, but my experience of Losing My Virginity was interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, when I'd finished, I thought um, that... <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought... Uh, I need that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I thought people were meant to... Stop having orgasms, but anyway, it, it, it carried, it, she carried on and on and on, and it was, and and I was be beating my chest by then, thinking, my God, what a man I am, and <laughs> so uh, so I, I sort of get back onto the bed, and and and, <laughs> and she whispers to me, asthma attack, asthma attack, <laughs> and. And I go, oh no, it's nothing to do with me. Uh, she, she, and uh, anyway, half an hour later, the ambulance arrives, and 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 I was put back in my box. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, right, where were we? Um, <laughs> that is not the answer I was expecting <laughs> or looking for. So there's uh, a new book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be invited back here again, am I? I know. <laughs> uh, new book, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so as I was saying, I love trying things for the first time. 
Um, the, um, and um, the new book is about um, the last 20 years um, since the first book. And, um, and, you know, I'm very lucky. I lo because I love trying things for the first time, uh, I, um, I'm known as Dr. Yes, and, uh, and it gets me into a lot of trouble, so it makes, a good, makes for a good read as a book. Um, uh, but it also means that I end up learning about an aw awful lot of different things in life. And, um, and every day, I, you know, I, I, I see as another day, one, another wonderful day of learning, learning something new. And, um, you know, at the end of the book, um, I've uh, had a final chapter about the 75 ways I've tried to try to kill myself in my life and, um, and how I've ended up failing. Um, but um, even though 75 uh, lives that I, <laughs> the 75 lives uh, that I that, that I nearly lost, but each one of them was a great, you know, was it was a wonderful, uh, exciting episode. Um, but the problem is, if you try things for the first time, uh, sometimes uh, and nobody's tried it before, it, you're sometimes taking risks. So um, yeah, so I've been pulled out of the sea five times by helicopters. Um, I think I've got the Guinness World Record just for the most times being rescued by helicopter out of the sea. Um, I sponsor, <laughs> sponsor London's ambulance helicopter service to say thank you very much to all helicopters who ever pulled me out of the sea. Um, and anyway, there are a lot of other stories like that. Um, but um, amidst the adventure side, um, you know, there's obviously a deadly serious side of, um, of um, building some really fun businesses and taking on some, taking some of the bigger, bigger biggest companies in the world. So I do want to hear about adventure. So you have, what, seven Guinness Book of World Records uh, for hot air ballooning, for kiteboarding across the English Channel. I, I have a lot of questions, but the first one is why? Like, wh why do you do this? Um, because I would hate to somebody to have come to me and said, would you like to be the first person to fly around the world in a balloon? And, or the first person to cross the Atlantic in a hot air balloon? Uh, and um, and for me to sit back, you know, two years later, having said no, and watch somebody else do it. Um, so, you know, I just love, I love, um, I, you know, I mean, when, when somebody did come to me and say, you know, how about us, the two of us being the first to cross the Atlantic in a hot air balloon? And I said, well, when are you thinking of going? And he said, in two months' time. And I said, well, I can't fly a hot air balloon. And he said, well, two months' time, you can get your, your ballooning license. Um, and... Um, uh, and anyway, yeah, two months later, I found myself sitting at Sugarloaf Mountain in Maine, uh, ready to climb into the, <laughs> the biggest balloon ever built, um, and um, heading off on a, a spectacular adventure. Um, uh, and, um, and yeah, it all went wrong at the end, but we did, we did get across the Atlantic. <laughs> Touche. And after that, and, I, and of course, he jumps out. He's the experienced balloonist of 25 years. He jumps out of the balloon. I'm left flying this balloon on my own. But anyway, you have to read the book to find out about that. But it was, uh, it was a little bit hairy. We won't spoil it, but that wasn't the, the end of the altitude. So you then decide, I'm going to go into the space flight business. What was that about? Um, well, uh, let me ask a question. How many people would like to go to space in this room? Okay, I think there's your answer. <laughs> um, I think I think um, eighty percent of uh, any group I meet of people, are, I, I mean, I would love to go to space. We'd all love to go to space. I think, or you know, there's a few a few exceptions. Uh, if um, we could be reasonably sure about a return ticket, um, <laughs> and 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 if we could afford it, um, and so. Over the last 12 years, um, we've been trying to build a space line. Um, and it's, you know, it's not been easy. Um, we never thought it would be easy. In fact, it's been ev even tougher than we thought. We, we've got um, 700 of the best engineers in America, quite a few from NASA. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, we've had, we've had tears um, uh, and, um, but, you know, but I think we're, we're, we're on the verge of, um, of um, achieving um, every, everything we've dreamt. Um, 
and over the next um, 60, 90 days, uh, VSS Unity, which is our first spaceship, um, uh, should be in space. And, and then quite soon after that, I'll go to space. And then you know, a, lot, a lot of people, um, a lot, lot of other people over the, over the years to come will have a chance to go to space. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're building a spaceship. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, come on, it's exciting. If you're able to <laughs> do, the, you know, if you're able to build a spaceship um, and, uh, and uh, a space line, we're, gonna, we're building, you know, four spaceships. Um, uh, we've, got, we've got a beautiful spaceport in New Mexico. Um, uh, we've got a wonderful mothership. Um, design is very important in everything we do at Virgin. I mean, they're beautifully designed. Um, uh, we've got wonderful test pilots who are going to be the brave people to take it through its paces, um, and then they, they will become astronauts taking people up. Um, we've got a, a company called Virgin Orbital, which will be putting, uh, hopefully, thousands of satellites around the Earth, and we're going to be planning to put a couple of thousand satellites around the Earth in about three years' time, which will help connect the um, the um, uh, the four billion, five billion people who are not connected, um, uh, because we're the only company of the of the people who are pushing into space who've got a spaceship designed like a, an airplane. Um, the others have got straightforward rockets. Um, expanding that to go to point to point travel is something which you know is 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 very possible. Um, oh, well, let's have a break from listening to me. We'll shove the video on. <laughs> of all time. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory on Mount Everest was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there, the space is there, and we're going to climb it. Virgin Galactic aspires to be the world's first commercial space line. So what does that mean? It means not just that we're operating a single space vehicle, but that we're creating an incredible experience for our customers. And it means that many of the things that we do have never been done before. resources as fragile environment the more people that see that themselves the more they'll make that part of their daily lives and I hope by the time my kids are ready to go into space we've changed our global culture to recognize that space is where we belong and the earth is something that needs to be a little better protected. But um, uh, yeah, so I painted a sort of picture of you know being in business should be fun and 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 of course um, and of course with, with businesses there's also a deadly serious side. Um, I think the, the the I think the fun aspect can actually you know improve the safety of you know I mean if you if you if you have airlines if the uh, engineers 
um, you know, lo love the company. They, they, um, if each individual airplane in an airline company has a personal name, so people actually know, uh, know it's not just a number, it's a name. Um, uh, you know, all these things, all these things are important, I think, in, build, in building up the sort of um, safety culture of an airline. And, uh, you know, we've had three airlines which we've run for um, uh, 35 years in, in total. And, um, uh, and we've never had an incident. And, uh, and, and obviously, you know, safety is the main, not the number one um, important thing. Um, in building a space line, um, there are risks. And, um, and you know, most things you can, uh, you know, your engineers, everything can test on the ground. There are some things that can only be tested in the air. And, um, and four years ago, or three and a half years ago, um, one of our test pilots made a mistake, or, or one of the test pilots made a mistake, um, and it was a catastrophic mistake. Um, and as a um, as an owner of a company where where where, where um, you know, there's been an accident, um, and I obviously again write about it in um, in my book. Um, you know, the, the the most important thing is confront it, you know, straight away, get, get, you know, I was on Necker Island at the time, I got, I got the call, um, you know, got on a plane, got to the Mojave Desert as quickly as I could. Um, and, uh, and just to be with, to be with your people. I mean, like um, all 600 engineers had seen, seen the accident um, and they were all feeling ghastly. Um, you know, I mean, first of all, you know, they'd spent, Eight years working on this project, it was just uh, just about there, um, and I mean, fortunately, we, we could we could we had um, you know cameras everywhere, and we could see what had happened, and um, and I was able to talk to them all to tell them that uh, you know it wasn't their fault um, that they'd done a wonderful job in creating you know very very safe craft, um, and um, and. Uh, and then, you know, some people are religious, some people are not religious. Um, uh, I think, you know, we decided the biggest hug in history was the way to deal with it. So all 800 of us had a, a massive hug. Um, and, uh, and we then, you know, we, 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 we all basically decided together, you know, we're not going to give up now, we're going to carry on. And uh, the 700 astronauts who'd signed up, uh, bar about, um, five uh, stuck with it. Um, we had people like the president of Iceland's wife rang up and booked a ticket the very day of the accident, just as a as a goodwill gesture. And we had some lovely, you know, wonderful gestures as well. Um, and um, uh, and you know, there were not so nice things, which again I write about in the book. Um, uh, um, you know, there, there, there are elements of the press that just love to see people fall flat on their face, and uh, we just had to deal with that, but um, and, and, and brush it off. But um, but anyway, you know, three and a half years later, um, the team have done a fantastic job, and we're now right back on track again. You went through another harrowing experience this fall. Uh, you could have left Necker. You chose to stay there through Hurricane Irma in a basement with with a bunch of your team. What was that like, and where do we need to go on disaster relief now? Um, wow, the world seems to be. I, I was I was in San Francisco yesterday, meant to be for throwing our first Virgin Sporting event in San Francisco, and um, and that got cancelled because of the fires in Sonoma and Napa Valley, um, and so there certainly are. You know, the hurricane is hitting. Uh, UK today, you know, I mean, um, uh, you know, I mean, almost unheard of. And I mean, what you know, what is happening? I, I believe is that the sea is getting hotter, the world is getting hotter, and it doesn't seem to take much, you know, much increase in heat before hurricanes become more intense. And um, uh, and I know you have a a um, uh, a. Um, sort of solar energy, you know, you, you've got a, a, a division in this university of people who are looking into all this, um, and the sooner, the sooner we can have breakthrough technologies, the better. But, um, but, yeah, we got a force, uh, effectively a um, category seven hurricane 
um, there isn't a Category 7, but technically it would have been a Category 7 if there was, uh, um, hit us. Um, and it was ferocious. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, it looked like a nuclear bomb had hit, 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 um, hit us. Um, and, um, and I've, you know, I've spent with my son and daughter um, the last six weeks trying to, uh, I mean, I've just come from Washington the day before, about three days ago, um, seeing the World Bank, seeing the IMF, um, uh, um, you know, seeing the, the um, International American Development uh, Bank and, and to try to sort of rally, rally support, not just for the British Virgin Islands, but for the whole Caribbean. I mean, Puerto Rico, a whole, whole, lot, of, whole lot of islands have been completely um, trashed. Um, and also with, you know, trying to turn the Caribbean into um, a clean, clean energy, you know, now from dirty energy, um, uh, with, um, with small, small uh, micro -grid gr grids so that, you know, they don't just lose all their energy for nine months, as looks like it's going to happen on some, some of the big, the big islands um, in the Caribbean. Um, our solar panels on our island, uh, we had our electricity back and running the next day, um, whereas people who were relying on diesel, um, they're looking at a nine, nine month um, to, to fix their problems. Um, so, um, uh, so out of, you know, I mean, it, when, when adversity hits, you just got to try to come back with something better than was there before. Um, our house got burnt down, again, I write about it in the book, <laughs> seven years ago, uh, and we made sure that, you know, the new house that we built was a, a, a lot better and a lot stronger and um, and uh, romance blossomed from it so uh, you know so you, you know you, you, there's often good things come out of bad I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about the Council of Elders that you set up with Nelson Mandela and what role that's playing in the world today and and how you think about how a group of people who you know really just stands on the respect and credibility that they've earned uh, can really drive change well, um, there were two of us who, who um, Peter Gabriel, um, who was one of our artists on Virgin, he, he had a, a similar idea, um, and, uh, and I had a, another a, an experience. We put the two ideas together, and we, we, we formed the elders. Um, my personal experience was, um, uh, was uh, there were some hostages in Iraq, um, and uh, and um, and this was some time ago, and um, and Saddam Hussein had these hostages, and I knew King Hussein of Jordan, and I um, asked him if he could have delivered to Ki to Saddam Hussein a letter from myself, uh, but endorsed by King Hussein, to see if we could uh, bring some medical supplies into Iraq and bring the all, uh, any any hostage that was not completely well back out again and the young young people as well and surprisingly he agreed to do so so um, so we flew in with a with a 747 full of volunteers from England and in those days we only had four planes so um, uh, so uh, and you know the airport hadn't been used for two years the lights went on at the last minute um, an, an, an airport as big as Heathrow with not one plane on it. Very, it was quite an airy feeling. And um, Saddam Hussein came to the airport and handed over the hostages, and, um, and we took off and we left. Um, and it was a wonderful feeling. For, and, and, um, and, um, and then put the clock forward a few years later, um, uh, George Bush Jr. and Tony Blair decided um, to invade again, and um, uh, and I knew uh, people who had been involved in looking for these weapons of mass destruction and talking to them. They just said, "It's bollocks. There, are, there are no weapons of mass destruction." Um, and um, so, uh, so we were doing everything we could to try to stop stop the war, um, uh, and. Um, and we, we contacted Saddam Hussein. Um, he was willing to have Nelson Mandela come and meet him. Um, and um, with, the, uh, with our idea that we would then try to persuade him to step down in the interests of the Iraqi people um, and, and go and live elsewhere and um, avoid a horrible war. And um, 
Mandela said he would do it if, he, if we could get Kofi Annan to join him. And um, Kofi Annan then agreed to join him. Um, and the, uh, the day before they were due to fly, um, the bombing started. And so the trip, trip never took place. Um, and you know, the Iraqi war has, has cost you know, hundreds of thousands of lives and maimed hundreds of thousands of people, has, has resulted in ISIS, has, uh, you know, the, this, the whole Syrian conflict, I don't think, would have happened without it, and, and so on. Um, so, you know, we then spoke with Nelson Mandela and said, look, you know, you, you know it may be if you'd got there two days sooner, um, you, th this, you, you may have been able to avert that war. So, let, so maybe, w you know, would you be willing to be the founding father of a, of a new group of elders that um, you, you, could, you appoint um, that you that look for the 12 people in the world that you, you think have the highest moral standing, um, who are in maybe the last 15 years of their lives, um, who, um, uh, who you know, are no longer interested in party politics. Um, and he agreed to found the elders. And, um, and he appointed people like President Carter from America, uh, Mary Robinson from Ireland, um, Kofi Annan, Archbishop Tutu, um, uh, you know, Ban Ki Moon has just joined, and, and others, and um, incredibly incredible group of people. And and over the last ten years, they've gone into uh, conflict regions and knocked heads together. I think avoided some conflicts. They've done their best to stop other conflicts that have already started. Um, and they've also used their moral authority to speak out on you know, issues that they feel very strongly about. Um, you know, last week they said that what Trump had done um, in trying to rip, rip up the Iran nuclear deal, they felt was, was a ghastly mistake, and they spoke, spoke, spoke out about it. Um, and, uh, you know, they've set up organizations like um, uh, Girls Not Brides um, to try to encourage countries to stop you know, 12 year olds, 11 year olds, 10 year olds being um, married off and trying to encourage young, young girls to be able to go, go to school. Um, uh, you know, they were in the Paris talks you know, last year, um, campaigning to push the, um, the, the climate talks through. Um, and some of these people are 85, 86, 90, 92 years old, but, but they've got tremendous moral authority and, and um, people listen to them. You say something really interesting in the book. Uh, you say, if your life is one long success story, you're most likely a liar. And you've, you've had no shortage of failures in your life. I think of, I don't know, virgin cola, clothing, cosmetics. I'm sure you can make a much longer list. But can you, for an audience of people that's often terrified of failure, can you talk to us a little bit about how you think about that and, and how you continue to, to take risks? Well, I could have added it also makes for a much better book if, uh, if, if, if you've got a little bit of uh, ups and downs because there's no nothing worse than reading somebody's autobiography where uh, all, they, all they include is all these lovely successes that go from one step to another. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, look, um, I, as I said earlier, I um, love to say yes. I love to try things. Um, and... Um, and you know, sometimes fall flat on my face, um, sometimes succeed. I think because we generally start things from scratch, um, we, we, we haven't had any sort of massive dramatic failures that have re really sort of, uh, cr you know, damaged the foundations of Virgin. Um, so, you know, we generally speaking, you know, if we start a, you know, a bank or well, a financial service company, we'll just literally start, you know, start in a very small way and then build it, build it up from there. Um, you know, if we start an airline, we start with one plane and we, you know, we build it up from there. Um, generally, uh, because we've created companies that are much better than our rivals, um, generally the public, you know, um, identify with them and, um, and generally that it, and more often than not, it's successful. Where we've come unstuck is where we've, we've, we've taken on a big Goliath, Coca-Cola, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you know, your product just can't be fundamentally better. I mean, it can be, you know, some people may say it tastes better, some people, you know, but, um, and, 
And, uh, you know, for a year with, when, we, when we took on Coca-Cola, I thought, Christ, we're gonna, you know, we're going to be the biggest brand in the world. We're out selling Coke, we're out selling Pepsi um, uh, in every store in Britain. Um, and, uh, and, um, and so I got a Sherman tank and I drove into Times Square in New York and um, turned, the, turned the turret on the Coca-Cola sign, which we'd um, had pyrotect the turret, pyrotect um, <laughs> wired up the night before. Uh, and, um, and it looked like we blew, blew up the sign. Um, anyway, Coca-Cola weren't amused, understandably. And, um, <laughs> uh, and, um, and what happened, and I only found this out because about two years after, um, my new bank manager at um, Lloyd's Bank in England invited me out for dinner, and she happened to be the woman who was behind this uh, back at Coke two years earlier. Um, she... Um, went in to see the chairman of Coke, or the president of Coke, and said, um, you know, this little virgin brand, we've got, we got to take them seriously. They, you know, they're outselling us in Britain, and, you know, like a bushfire, it could, it could, you know, it could catch on, it could take, you know, take us around the world. And so he initially didn't take us seriously, then a month later he looked at the new set of figures. Uh, he then called her in and said, right, um, there's a DC-10 on the runway at Atlanta Airport, it's full of cash, it's full of squat teams. Um, you're gonna lead the charge, you're going to England, and I want you to s snuff them out. And, um, uh, and they, I mean, Virgin Cola just disappeared from the shelves of Tesco's everywhere, it just suddenly disappeared. And we had no idea why people were taking it off. Um, you know, th um, th we would ring, ring retailers and you know, protest, and you know, they wouldn't let us know, and it wasn't until two years later that we found out what had happened. Um, and anyway, we were kneecapped. <laughs> but, and the problem was that you know, look, w w with British Airways, when we had a similar thing, our, our product was better, and so you know, we, we survived. But, um, uh, but um, with a can of cola, anyway, it, we, we lost that battle. So uh, you have a friend, uh, Barack Obama, who recently went dark on social media and then popped up grinning, kiteboarding with you. <laughs> and, I, I think there are a lot of people in this room who are curious about, like, what did you talk about, and what was what was that like? Well, what 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 I feel like I, I, I what I feel I could say I talked about I've, I've included in the book. Um, I mean, he, um, uh, you know, it was the day after he stepped down. Um, he, uh, he and Michelle deserved a holiday. They really had no proper holiday for eight years. Um, that he deserved to get out on the water. I mean, he, he used to be a, a surfer. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I um, said I would teach him to kite surf, and he, he learned with a vengeance. Um, and uh, and basically, they 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 had ten days where you know they let their hair down. They they were uh, as delightful as one could imagine. You know, not knowing them personally, uh, and. Um, uh, and, you know, they were the kind of people who, you know, by the end of the 10 days, they knew every single staff member's name, you know, personally. Um, you know, instead of, uh, uh, you know, they, they insisted on throwing um, uh, a party of all the local staff on their last night there. Um, you know, the, a couple of staff members I noticed were standing in the corner. Nobody was dancing with them. Uh, you know, I saw Barack and Michelle go straight to them and drag them onto the dance floor. And um, uh, anyway, just exceptional people. And um, as citizens of the world, I think you know we we the whole world looked up to them. And you know, we saw them as our president, um, and 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 um, as much as uh, Americans, I think, saw them as their their president. And um, and we we were very proud of America. I thought it was a um, uh, a shine, shining light to the world, and, and um, yeah, it was sad they stepped down. <laughs> <laughs> so we have we have a bunch of great audience questions. Uh, we'll we'll try to get through as many of these as we can. So we'll uh, we'll aim for rapid fire here. Uh, one is, what's the worst piece of career advice you've ever received? Um, 
I never really thought of myself as having a career as such. Um, let me think. Worst piece of uh, career advice. What, um, can you, uh, I'm a dyslexic as well. Help me explain what that would mean to me. Career advice. Did you have people talking you out of becoming an entrepreneur, out of going into businesses that okay. succeeded? Um, so, yeah, so my dad, I must admit, walked me when I was 15, I decided to leave school. <laughs> Uh, and um, uh, and I wanted to leave school because there was another unjust war talking about wars. And something that students should really examine is, you know, uh, why so many of the wars. That, you know, the Vietnamese War was the most awful war. Um, there's a wonderful film that should be everybody should see called Fog of War um, by Robert McNamara uh, uh, that he made on his deathbed six months before he died. Um, and he made it um, because he wanted Bush Jr. not to invade Iraq. He could see that exactly the mistake that America had made invading North Vietnam was going to be made again by, um, uh, by Bush Jr. And it was, a, it was very powerful. And you know, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish um, that George Bush Jr. had taken, taken heed. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, my dad walked me around the garden, as dads you know, should do when a 15-year-old says, I'm going to quit school. Um, and, um, and, and the first time round, I think you know, his advice was to stay at school, and I think that was a bad advice. Um, anyway, on the third, on the third time round, um, he said, you know something, Richard? Um, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do when I was 22. Um, you know what you want to do when you're 15. You know, um, give it a go, and if it doesn't work out, we'll try to get you a formal education again. So it, it turned into good advice. <laughs> you mentioned dyslexia. What was it like growing up uh, with, with some of those challenges, and what do you feel are the, the advantages? It's funny, I, we, we climbed a mountain last week um, in, in Morocco called Mount Tubkul, and um, Simon Simonek, I was walking, walking with up the mountain, and um, we were trying to think, you know, why is dyslexia called dyslexia? I mean, it's, you know, it, 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 you know first of all, dyslexics can't spell, so why have a name that you can't spell? <laughs> um, uh, secondly, you can't read, so why have a name you, can never pr you can't pronounce? Um, and we we, th this was an 18-hour um, climb up the mountain and back down again, and by the end of it, we, we came up with um, alternative thinker as, as a, an alternative for the word dyslexic, dyslexia. Um, and I'm gonna blog about it this week and see if people can come up with any other better, better names than alternative thinker. But, um, but when you're young and, you, and you're suffering from, suffering from dyslexia, um, you don't realize that it's potentially a blessing. Um, you just find that you know, it's, it's, it's difficult doing the basic thing, ba the basic um, things that are shoved down your throat you know, when, when, when you're young at school. And, um, uh, and, you know, when I was young, I just thought I was thick, and uh, the school definitely thought I was thick and stupid, and, um, and um, but uh, as I got older, I realized that, um, you know, it was a blessing. I mean, it taught me the art of delegation, uh, because, you know, I've become, I'm thinking, one of the best delegators I know, and I try to encourage um, other entrepreneurs who are setting up their businesses to, you know, find somebody else to re replace them, put yourself out of business. Um, you know, that means you can then think about the bigger picture and you can move on to the next project and then put yourself out of business again and, 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 and keep, keep repeating that. Um, and so many entrepreneurs are not, are not good delegators. So being dyslexic, I had to be a good delegator. Um, being dyslexic, I um, have to simplify everything. So you know, when people come a deal with Virgin, it, we, we're, we're very, we, we speak in quite a simplistic way, and we, and we get our messages across very clearly. Um, we don't use jargon, we don't use PowerPoints, we, uh, you know, we, we use pictures, we use videos. Um, we, um, uh, we don't, in, you know, in, if, you, if, we, if we're in, our, in, in the financial service industry, we don't use phrases like bid off or spread, which nobody understands. and, um, and um, and and um, so yeah, we say we say we say it like it is, and, and I think 
that, that you know uh, that, that that has really helped build Virgin over the years. Mm -hmm. You've uh, you've named Steve Jobs as the entrepreneur you admire most, and I'm wondering what you admire about him, and also how you feel about the way he treated other people. I think the I think um, look he's he, he built the most extraordinary company and. Um, I mean, I used to lug around suitcases full of paperwork, and and and, uh, and I don't have back problems anymore, thanks to Steve Jobs. I can now got this, you know, one little iPad, and it's all it's all there. Um, so, um, but yeah, his his fault um, was that he didn't he didn't seem like a great motivator of people. Um, uh, you know, he didn't he didn't sound like he you know was a great pra yeah praiser of people, um, and and. He micromanaged, um, but it, it worked. So, um, although we don't run our companies like that, it's it, it's not, it, 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 it's um, it somehow worked for him. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, yeah, there's a lot of people I admire, and um, uh, and uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily put him on a on a complete pedestal, but he's but he cr he's created something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more for Virgin to still do in terms of the number of industries you could enter, the number of companies you could disrupt. Uh, what, are the, what are the industries that are kind of piquing your interest lately? And where might we, we look to see you go in the next few years? Um, we, I don't necessarily know. Um, I mean, that's the exciting thing about Virgin. We, we'll, we'll, we'll see you know, something that frustrates us, and we'll think, you know, Christ, we could do it better. And we'll, we'll, dive, we'll dive in and, and, and do it. Um, but you know, we, we are, I mean, for instance, I would never go on a cruise ship. Um, uh, so um, I, we've decided to build um, three beautiful cruise ships that I would like to go on and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and that my friends would like to go on. And I suspect everybody in this room would have a blast on as well. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm going to lay the keel in Italy next week uh, of the first of those and uh, in, a, in a couple of years' time. Um, uh, they'll be there. I actually, when I was 25, wanted to build a cruise ship that I would like to go on, and it was going to be for under 30, under 30 year olds. And um, <laughs> and then I, when I got to 31, it was going to be under 31 year olds, 32 year olds, 33 year olds, <laughs> 34 year olds. <laughs> anyway, uh, so finally we're there. Hopefully, under 70 year olds is <laughs> going to be it's going to be a really fun cruise ship. This, <laughs> um, but. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, I mentioned Hyperloop is something which um, uh, I'm excited about. Um, the um, the uh, you know to to have a train that travels that you know could travel up to a thousand miles an hour, but I mean you know realistically, if you're not going to be sick going around the corners, sort of six fifty, six hundred miles an hour, but it's faster than a plane and. There, there are quite a lot of places in the world that that you know that will benefit from um, from Virgin Hyperloop, and 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 that um, we've just announced, and we'll will most likely be doing build building off. I mean, well, we've got the test site in the in the Nevada desert. Um, it's going extremely well, and 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 hopefully we'll. I think I'll do our first one in the Middle East in about eighteen months' time. Start building. Um, uh, Anyway, there are there are very the very the, you know we've got we're building Virgin hotels in a number of cities in America. Um, uh, again, uh, you know, I, I very rarely in a city do you find a hotel that uh, that is you know just just got it right. And I think we, you know we experimented with one hotel in Chicago. Uh, it's Condé Nast Traveler's best hotel in America, and um, and we we can we're now rolling it out into Nashville and um, New York and. And San Francisco and other places, and just trying to make you know very virgin and r really fun, you know, fun, fun to, um, uh, you know, fun to go in. But most of my time nowadays is spent on the not-for-profit ventures. So you know, so we, um, uh, yeah, so it's it's built, it's it, it, it's tackling, uh, you know, using using the fact that I can pick up the phone to most people in the world and they'll take my call. Um, I'm not sure the White House would, but uh, most people in this world. Um, <laughs> And um, and get through and um, and and if you can if you get yourself into that position in life then you don't want to waste that position you want to try to you know um, sort you know 
use it to try to, uh, you know, create more marine, marine reserves in the world, to try to, you know, protect the species that are in peril in the world. Um, you know, try to change, you know, drug regulation to, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to regulation that's sensible, to, you know, and so on. I mean, there's just so many problems in this world that need, that need, that need um, sorting. Um, you know, last week, you know, we, 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 we helped set up a fund for people in America who, um, uh, who don't get bail. I mean, you, you've got this, in, this ridiculous situation in America where the rich, um, they commit a big crime, they just write out a check, and they go free for a year or two waiting for their trial. The poor, they get their, they're sent straight to prison whether they're guilty or innocent, and a lot of them are innocent and they languish in prison, um, and they lose their jobs, and they, you know, maybe lose their family, and, you know, I mean, it, it, and, and so, you know, we've help, helped set up a fund um, that, um, you know, can lend money to these people, but, I mean, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be necessary. Government should, you know, should realize that, it, that the, the, the law is an ass in this area and sort it out. So there are people in the room wondering, I'm not going to ask you about your favorite cheese or about what it's like to be so cool. But uh, I, you can ask that. <laughs> I do. Uh, I I do want to say that you you have a, a remarkable habit of writing things down, and um, I think the, the first time we met was a couple years ago at a dinner. It was there were maybe thirty CEOs there, and you were the only one taking notes. And people are looking around like Richard Branson is taking notes. Like why is no one else? And I just wondered if if you could tell us why. Um. It may it may go back to my dyslexia, um, uh, and but actually, I, you know, I, I, I actually think it's good for people whether they're dyslexic or not. Um, I think the I, I can't um, uh, I, I, I see sort of managing directors of companies sort of walking around their business talking to their employees, and the empl every, you know almost every employee has an idea, and and they'll nod and they'll say you know what a great idea. But I know that they're not going to remember that idea the next day. And if they don't write it down, they're not going to do anything about it. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the whatever the suggestion was, um, often, you know, something that it keeps going wrong will keep going wrong. Um, uh, if I'm having a meeting with people, um, you, you know, I, I look around the room sometimes and that maybe in, in a meeting 20 different ideas come up. I know at least 19 of those 20 ideas will never get actioned if people don't take notes. Um, and, and actually leaving a sort of a secretary to take notes and then distribute them, somehow I, 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 I think that when you write them down, you, you're gonna more likely to deal with them and, rem and, and, and remember them. So, you know, so I'll write these things down. I mean, I think what, you know, one of the reasons I think Virgin Atlantic and Virgin America and, you know, were, 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 you know, were such exceptional airlines and now are such exceptional airlines, is because we, do, we worry about the details. I mean, if you get every single little detail right, um, then the people who work for the company will be so, so proud and so happy of the company. They won't have customers complaining because uh, every little detail is, is sorted. And, um, and they, can, they can afford to smile. They can afford to have a good time. Um, so I think... Um, yeah, I, I do think note-taking note is one of the best bit, bits of advice I can give to people. We have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs in the room. Uh, you were just on Shark Tank here in the US. What, what advice would you give to people who want to start companies, and what do you look for when you invest? Um, well, uh, what advice? Um, I mean, if somebody feels they've come up with an idea that's going to make a, a, a real positive difference to other people's lives, which is basically what a company is, I would say, you know, just screw it, just do it and get on, you know, don't waste your time. And, um, and you know, if you're at college, start it, start it from here. Don't, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't wait necessarily till you leave college. Um, you can start the whole process here. You'll have lots of people that you can work, work with on, on your project. Um, and, um, it's, yeah, so gather, you know, gather a great, a wonderful group of people around you who believe in your idea, um, and uh, and, um, uh, and 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 just give it a go. And 
your first company, you're going to learn, um, learn an awful lot. I mean, the first company, you're going to learn almost everything there is to running a business, um, how to deal with people, how to motivate people, how to praise people, never criticize people, always look for the best in people. Um, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, you know, if you can run one company, you know, I mean, I think I've proven this, <laughs> but, you know, if you can run a student magazine, uh, you know, you can run a record company. If you can run a record company, you can run an airline. If you can run an airline, you can run a, uh, a health club chain. If you can run a health club chain, you can run a mobile phone company. I mean, if you can run a mobile phone company, you can run a bank, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, 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 uh, it's all about people, um, and that's all it is. And, you know, if you're going to run an airline, you know, get, a, get the chief technical officer of a rival airline to come and run it for you so you, you know you're running a safe airline. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, once you've got your team in place, um, you, know, it, um, you, you know, give them the freedom to make mistakes, give them the freedom to do good things, um, give them the freedom to create magic. Um, don't criticize them when they make, when, 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 they, when, when they mess up. And don't try to, don't think that, uh, that they're gonna do everything exactly as you would do it. Um, um, they, you know, sometimes they'll do things better than you'd do it, and you'll be pleasantly surprised. <clears throat> Sometimes they'll do things not quite like you'd do it, or maybe not not quite as good. But the fact that you've delegated means you're going to be able to achieve a hell of a lot more. So as we wrap up, uh, I love in the book this image of you. Uh, somebody goes onto a, a Virgin plane and opens the luggage compartment, and you roll out. Uh, should that happen to one of us? Uh, I understand that you don't like handshakes. How should we greet you instead? Well, I, th I, th I mean, fist bumps, I, l I learned from Obama. And, um, uh, and I'll tell you what, one out of every 100 Americans, and it's only Americans, they, they take your hand and they look you in the eyes and, and they, they look like they're going to, you know, just, I mean, there's no bones are going to be left in your fingers. <laughs> and, 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 the, and they feel that this, you know, this is the way to say, I really love you. And it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so, so, so that's why I think I prefer, fist, I, pr I prefer the fist bump these days. But um, they, um, I, I, I'm pretty good at telling. I mean, I, I, I walk up to this, you know, walk up to these people and I look at them, you look at them and I think, mm. Yeah, so I'll take I'll take a risk with quite a few, and then there's just occasionally it's <laughs> sort of getting 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 experience in that. But um, they um, so you you you've um, uh, the Cheryl Sandberg book. Well done, that was great. He wrote he, he, he did that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But there has, there, there has to be a punchline to that. It was number one last week, but. <clears throat> In the business books, but <coughs> <laughs> who invited oh, this oh, guy? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just sort of dropped down a bit. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure you'll come back next week. <laughs> oh, we'll be back. Don't worry. Uh, but he writes really well. But he I, does. He I, does. I will say, like that that part notwithstanding, we've been thrilled to have you here in Philly. <laughs> anyway, and, thanks very uh, much. We're, oh. we're delighted that you came. Uh, just be before we thank uh, before we thank Richard formally, uh, he did come here to Philadelphia, and there's a Philadelphia experience that people need to have. Can we uh, can we roll the video here? <laughs> thank you, Richard. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thank you, thank you.